Are we courageous enough to ask God to show us our sin? Are we courageous enough to ask? Are we, we faithful enough to know that when God shows us our sin, He does not condemn us? But He calls us to confession and repentance and holy living. Thank you. Our Sunday school, uh, we have a new adult Sunday school class kind of beginning and it's kind of taking the place of the other one because our teacher has, has been out uh, unavoidably. So what, what we're doing is, uh, we, we've, it's called the Seven Minute Seminary Video Series put out by an organization called Seedbed, which is um, very biblically Wesleyan oriented faith statements. And uh, there, we've talked about holiness, we've talked about uh, the faith of the church, we've talked about this morning about uh, a, a great spiritual awakening. And so every Sunday there's that, and then there's a discussion guide to go along with it. So that means at 9.15 on Sunday mornings, you're more than welcome and hope you'll come and join us. I cannot stress upon you, and, and enough, it, the need for education among conservative Christians is critical. We are at a point where we must be knowledgeable about the things of God, about God himself, about the kingdom of God, about the character and nature and mission of the church. Uh, we're at a point where we must learn those things one of the things I've said for years is that we've allowed the church, the, the world to set our agenda as a church, and we've not bothered to learn what it means for us, for me, to be a part of the kingdom of God. So in the, in the fairly near future, I'm going to be doing a series on the kingdom of God, what, that, what it means to be a citizen of that kingdom. But I hope you will take advantage of the Sunday school hour and any other opportunities we have for growing in our faith. It's just incredibly important for that. Well, would you get your hymnal, please, and turn to hymn number 2031. It's in your little black hymnal, and we will sing it through twice. And I think you probably know this fairly well. Let's stand as we sing. ever think about bringing into the house of the Lord a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and joy? That is a marvelous way to begin our worship. Let us share together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
What was that? Amen. Oh, good. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there, there's got to be a... Uh, you can be seated. There's got to be some excitement and some enthusiasm. In fact, you know, you know one of the, the charges, the criticisms leveled against John Wesley and his crew? They were just too enthusiastic. He said once upon a time, he said, I get so excited, I'm going to paraphrase, I get so excited about preaching the Word of God that I get up every morning and I go and preach somewhere and I set myself on fire with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And people come from miles around to watch me burn. <laughs> Anybody been watching you burn lately? Something to think about. All right. Our offertory. During our offertory, please feel free to leave your offerings today. Our noisy offering will go to uh, Promise Point. Promise Point is a, a fairly new ministry uh, out the Goliad Highway. It's a, it's a residence place for homeless people. And they, they have a variety of services they can offer to them. And we want to help them as much as we can. So the noisy offering will go to Promise Point this morning. Doxology. What? Oh. <laughs> Even musicians make mistakes. Wow. All right. Well, let's, let's spend some time in the presence of our Lord. Uh, let's be quiet and listen for what he might speak into our hearts and minds today and join each other in prayer.
Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for calling us to this hour in the company of a host of saints around the world as we share times of worship and fellowship and growing together. We're grateful, Father, for the times you've touched our lives and delivered us from circumstances, from our own sin, from the hand of the enemy. We're grateful, Father, for your love, your mercy, and your grace that sustains us, that encourages us, that supports us in our daily lives and living. We're also grateful, Father, for the times that you've touched us when we have been ill or feeling poorly. And these folks, these family and friends that we have called before your throne of grace this morning, we lift before you and ask, Father, that you lay your hand upon each one, bringing about the healing of spirit, of soul, and or of body as there is need. We pray, Father, that we may be together in our worship and in our faith and in our love. We do ask, Father, your forgiveness for the times we have chosen to do those things that displeased you or dishonored you. Forgive us, Father, for using words we should not have used, doing things we should not have done, going places we should not have gone. We pray, Father, that our hearts and our minds may be stilled with your holy presence. You've called us to be holy, for you yourself are holy, and having been created in your image, O oh God, we are grateful to be able to reflect your character and your nature. So touch our hearts this morning, Father, as we worship. May we worship in spirit and in truth and be joined together as children of God. As we pray in the name of Jesus, that prayer that he has taught us as his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Would you get your hymnal and turn to page 534? Let's stand as we sing.
again. Please be seated. The second crucifixion. Kind of sounds like something Joel Rosenberg would write. Joel Rosenberg is a, a, a man who's had much experience in spiritual things and he's written several great novels. They have wonderful titles. And this sounds like something that he might write. The second crucifixion. How many, ever, how many of you have ever given thought to a second crucifixion? Really, any, honestly? Hmm. How many of us have given thought to the first crucifixion? The first one that really makes any difference. Well, there is a second crucifixion. And that's what I'd like to visit with you about for a few minutes this morning and hopefully challenge you to think about what the second crucifixion would mean for you as an individual. See, when it boils down, when it's all said and done, and we have kind of finished the day. It's based on what you and I do in regard to our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so as we consider the first crucifixion where Jesus suffered and died to set the world free from the law of sin and death, when he bought our forgiveness yours and mine, when he paid the price for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. That was chapter one, so to speak. Chapter two is where you and I come in. And so I want to read to you from Galatians chapter, verse, for first, first off, chapter two, verse 20 and 21. It says, I, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I live now in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up, delivered himself up for me. Paul becomes very personal in passages like this. He does not say what he did for all of us. He does that on occasion, of course. But he often becomes very personal. I believe part of that is he's, he's confessing his own frailties, his own sin, and he's giving us the opportunity to do the same kind of thing, to make it very personal in our relationship with God. In the name of Jesus Christ, who delivered himself up for me. Someone once said, a long time ago, I heard this and many, many years ago, said, if you had been the only person alive on the face of the earth when Jesus came to earth, he would have done the same thing. Because it's for you. It's for the one as well as the many. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live now by faith in the Son of God who delivered himself up for me. Now let's go over to the fifth chapter of Galatians. Verses um, 25 and 24 and 25. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I think what, part of what that last verse says is, if we're going to say that we live by the Spirit, then let our, let our walk match our talk, so to speak. But he says, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When we talk about the second crucifixion, that really means dying to ourselves because what we're dealing with is all of those things that tempt us on a daily basis. Tempt us to sin, tempt us to turn against God, tempt us to turn away from God, tempt us. There was a, a meeting in hell some time ago and Satan was addressing all of his little demons. 
And he said, uh, we've got to do a better job. These Christians are too tough. We've got, to, we've got to find a better way of getting them. And so one demon piped up and said, well, let's tell them there's no God. And everybody cheered. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Satan says, no, no, they're smarter than that. They know there is a God. And another one piped up and says, well, let's tell them there's a God, but let's tell them he doesn't love them. And oh, that brought the house down. Satan says, no, that won't work because they know he loves them. So everybody's mumbling and grumbling for a little bit. And finally, one little demon way back in the back of the pack said, I know what we can do. Let's tell them there's a God. Boo, boo's all over the house. And let's tell them that he loves them. Oh, it was getting tough. But then he said, and Satan says, you better get to the point because it's getting rough in here. What's the point? He said, let's tell them there's a God. Let's tell him he loves them. But let's tell him, tell them that they have plenty of time. They don't have to worry about making a decision now. We are called to crucify the flesh, and it's now. We don't wait until tomorrow. How many of you have known people who have died completely unexpectedly, completely unexpectedly? We all have known people like that. And we pray that if we are in that situation, we have made our peace with Jesus Christ. We have crucified our flesh. We have lived for him. So what does it mean to crucify the flesh? First, it means to recognize my own sin. My own sin. Psalm 32, Jesus, or the, the psalmist says, uh, excuse me, it wasn't Psalm 30, 32 yet, not yet. Not yet. In Romans 3.23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we've sinned against God. In thought, word, or deed. So the first thing we need to do in crucifying the flesh is to recognize that we have sinned. With things we've said, with things we've done, with relationships we've been in, with places we've gone, all of, all of it, all of it. There's not one of us among us who can say, I have not sinned. In fact, James says in, first, in, in, first, in John, 1 John 1, 9 and 10, he says, if you're faithful to confess your sin, God will, is faithful to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if anyone says they've not sinned, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. So we all have that. We recognize our sin. So, so what do we do next? We confess our sin. We confess before God. So this is where Psalm 32 comes in. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. How many of you realize and remember that on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. What was it that was finished? It was the, it was the necessary requirement for the forgiveness of sin. We call it salvation, we call it forgiveness, we, call, we maybe call it a lot of things but we have been set free from the law of sin and death. You know, we don't like to talk about sin. We, and, and I guess maybe the truth is, we don't like to say that we are sinners in one way or another. Sinners, and, and a, a, good, a, a good Christian way of saying it, sinners saved by grace. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. This is a gift of God lest anyone should boast. So that's who we are. And so we're in the process even now of getting rid of, if you want to use the word crucify, we can do that, but we're getting rid of those things that stand between us and God. Is there anything in your life standing between you and all that God has for you? I can't answer that question for you. You can't answer it for me or anyone else. You have to look inside yourself. Is there anything in your life that stands between you and God that, that keeps you from being everything God wants you to be? He created you for glory. He created you for, for wonder. He created you for his honor. That's who you are. 
And so we confess our sin before God. And it's, it, it, it's, it doesn't become a big deal, I don't think. It's just a matter of doing it. That's the beginning of the crucifixion of our flesh. And then the next thing we do is we repent. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus is uh, visiting with some folks and having dinner. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, we recognize our sin, we confess it before God, and then we begin the process of repentance. We begin the process not just of turning away. That's what we kind of have centered on for repentance, so turning away from sin. But when we turn away from something, we need to turn, turn towards something else. So repentance is really turning toward God. With every thought we think, every word we speak, every deed in which we engage, every relationship of which we are a part, we repent. We turn away from the sin and turn toward the God who gave himself up for us. And then finally, what we do is that Galatians 5, 25 passage. If we're going to say we live by the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. So the crucifixion of the flesh, the crucifixion of those things that stand between us and God becomes an absolute necessity for all of us. Now, many of us are going to say something like, well, I'm not a bad person. No, you're not. I haven't killed anybody. Uh, I haven't robbed anybody. I haven't cursed anybody. So I, I can't tell you the nature of any particular sin in your life. Certainly not. But I can say along with scripture, as Paul says, we've all sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory that God has for us. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you to search your own life. Search out your own experience. Search out your own being and see if there be any, as the psalmist says, any wicked way in you. And, and we, we describe wickedness as something uh, just terrible, horrible, but, but really it's any, anything that is against God. In fact, the word that in, in the New Testament that is used for the word sin, that is translated to sin, is an archery term. It's a word called hamartia, and it means to miss the mark. Now, how many of you know a little bit about archery? You know, you can miss the mark. You can miss the whole target, you know? Yeah, that, that's really missing the mark, all right. But you can miss the mark by the width of one line on the target. That is missing the mark. It doesn't have to be big. It can be very, very minute. Something that, that maybe you're not even aware of. And so, Lord, this is a good prayer. Lord, if there be any wicked way in me, as the psalmist says, show me that I might turn from it. Are we courageous enough to ask God to show us our sin? Are we courageous enough to ask? Are we, we faithful enough to know that when God shows us our sin, he does not condemn us? But he calls us to confession and repentance and holy living. Every day in our, in whatever we do. Now, most of us in this congregation are no longer gainfully employed. Now, there are some. There are some still working. Uh, and we're, we're thankful for that. And so we're not going to say that we don't have any opportunity. We, we just, we, we just kind of on our own, our own. We just kind of do our own thing. Maybe that in itself is a failure to recognize that God is not finished with you yet. As long as you're doing this. 
and doing it over and over again, God's not finished with you. And so seeking what God has for you is important. So think about crucifying the flesh, as, a, as the Bible says, with its passions and desires. Let's think about what it might mean, not just to turn away from sin, but to turn utterly toward God. What would that mean if you and I, if we're not, just forget that. What would that mean if you did that? What would it mean if I did that? 100% focused on God's plan for our life. Focused on the, the kingdom coming alive in our midst. Focused on everywhere we go, Jesus being our primary focus. My, you know, my favorite illustrations, H-E-B, Walmart, traffic. In fact, driving to, to church this morning, uh, yeah, driving to church this morning, there's this, this place uh, on Stockbauer at the Loop. It's two lane. And invariably, there's gonna be somebody in the outside lane who, who got there and who wants on the inside lane. And so they're going to gun it and cut in front of you. You're, you, have you. Have you seen that? And that's probably not the only place that happens, but that's where I see it a lot. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. I got through with that. And, and I just let the car in this morning. And, you know, it's, and, and I don't say that for any reason other than to say that those little things, my attitude is what counts. If I have a poor attitude, that can turn into sin against somebody else as well as against God. Do you see what I'm talking about? Just the small things that we don't even think about can be stumbling blocks for us in our own faith. And so just an encouragement to you this morning. Crucify the flesh. Get, get, get going with the second crucifixion. Now, I will say this. The first crucifixion was very short, very painful, incredibly so. If you want to know how painful it was, read you know, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Easter. He describes the crucifixion in extremely graphic terms. It was painful. The second crucifixion can also be painful because it requires that we recognize who we are and how we relate to God and other people. And it requires giving up something in favor of something better. That's not always easy to do. Our habits, our lifestyles, all of these are pretty well ingrained. We've been, we've been living like this for 127 years. I can't change now, but maybe, maybe God's calling you to change. If he is, then I would suggest you give it serious consideration. Let the crucifixion, the second one, begin for you and for me. Heavenly Father, Sometimes as we look at our own lives, we're, we're just not sure we want to go all the way. Be totally 100% committed to you. We ask your forgiveness for that. And we pray, oh God, that we may be enabled by the indwelling power and presence of your Holy Spirit to crucify our flesh, not the skin and bones, but, but that fleshly nature that we have so that we may be everything you created and called us to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Four hundred fifty-two. My faith looks up to thee. You see, the only way we're going to be able to do something like I've suggested this morning is by faith in Jesus Christ, letting Christ live in me. Let that be your watchword. Lord Jesus, live in me today. 
That's what this song's about. Let's stand as we sing. the congregation now folks th this couple you've known for you've been married 60 60 years and they were they were here when John Wesley began but somehow I'm not talking about John and Charles Wesley I'm talking about this congregation they're not that old but somehow Somehow, their names did not get entered in the membership roll of the book. And so this morning, they're going to join John Wesley after 30 years of being here. <laughs> and so we are glad to receive you. My goodness, we're just so, they've been part of our church family for all that time. And, and, and they were in, in, in another church I served as well. So it's good to welcome you. God bless you. Thank you so and, much. And, uh, and so we're just we're glad you're still glad part we of can us. Be voting members. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she said we're glad we can be voting members. <laughs> That's right. All right. Okay. All right. I will say this too. Rhett and Judy Williams uh, have been deconverted to the back row over there. <laughs> But Rhett and Judy, I'm going to ask you all to kind of get out in the, in the foyer and let people, folks say goodbye to you. Rhett and Judy are, are going back to their, their second home in Mississippi, right? <laughs> we claim their first home being here. They're, they're winter Texans. Okay. And so we're just going to let you, ask you to do that if you would. Just say goodbye to them. Okay. And so in the meantime... Before we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you, make his countenance shine upon you and grant you his peace, his hope, his joy, and his love. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.